So today we're going to roll a few shells and I've had a couple of folks asking about the shells and what we shoot and whatnot and kind of hard to explain because uh, you can't just name off one of the big manufacturers and send folks that way because I hand roll my shells half for some time. Um, Squirrel does, Chubbs does, Sleazy does. We all kind of hand roll our shells because we've shot TSS before it kind of um, has hit the main market. So um, rolling shells was just something that we did just because we wanted to shoot TSS. And uh, since then I do it because it's kind of part of the process. I kind of enjoy it. Uh, just having a little bit more to do with uh, my fingers in the whole process. So anyways, I thought I'd let you guys uh, join me. I'll just roll a few shells here. I'm gonna obviously need to spend some time in here, roll quite a few more, but for the sake of this uh, video, I'm just gonna have five shells lined up here and uh, kind of run through the process for you. I'm not gonna get into any specifics as far as a recipe um, because I don't, uh, basically I don't want any of you boys blowing your fingers off and going, Oh, that Pinhoti guy told me to do it that way. So anyway, um, we'll start from the top. Um, your recipe is going to call for all the components, and one of those components will be the shell that you're supposed to load. Uh, the shell that I load, this specific uh, recipe, calls for a fiocchi or fiocchi, however you want to say it, which side of the pond you're from, I guess. Um, so that's what these are, Some uh, just some fiocchi holes. They've already got the, the primers and all in them. Um, Something that I found out with uh, these inertia-driven guns like the Frankies and Benelli's is the length of the hole is a big deal um, because the shotguns will hang up a lot of times. They won't feed up from the magazine into the chamber. Um, so you need to trim this hole. They make hole, they make hole trimmers that you can drop down in this thing. And uh, apparently it's pretty nifty. My brother's got one. I don't have one. I kind of developed a process before I knew about the, short, the hole trimmers. And I take the hole and I've got a piece of PVC that I've got cut to two and 11 sixteenths, if I'm not mistaken, um, is the um, is the length of this, I'm about confident. Uh, it even says correct shell length, but it doesn't say the actual length. I'm fairly certain it is two and 11 sixteenths. Um, but I slide it over the hole, so nothing but the uh, excess that I need to trim sticks out. And you'll see this is a shell vise. Um, this is from Precision Reloading. It's the same vise that I'll use over there on the drill press shortly to actually put a roll crimp on the shell. Kind of the finishing touches is what kind of seals everything uh, up. But this is an eight gauge vise because it fits this piece of PVC um, and allows me to trim this hole without the hole spinning on me. I've got a little piece of double sided or like little uh, foam tape down at the bottom so that I can kind of put the hole in the vise, kind of put a little pressure on it like so and I will tighten the screw on it there. So now I've got something that I can kind of hold to cut the top off of it. Let me find my knife now. I'll go ahead and pull out the rest of these components. This is completely unrehearsed. I've just got the camera set up and I am kind of going to run through this. So don't think this is going to be any type of smooth process, but um, I'm going to go ahead and grab these components out of here since I'm going to be looking for my knife. I hope it's in here somewhere. Anyways, this is like a uh, something that my brother stumbled up on because he's a school teacher and you'll have to there's a certain part of this process where we'll be cutting some mylar and this is proven to be pretty handy for that rather than having to mark it all show you that later um i'll get that out and get everything else i keep all my reloading stuff in or majority of it in this one uh container here so i don't lose any of it because there are a lot of little wiggly parts that you got to kind of keep up with but i'll drag them out um this is a scale uh it says ballista scale um, it is, uh, you'll need a good digital scale, and this is inexpensive, but it's uh, very um, reliable, or has been for me. Uh, Hal Abbott um, kind of turned me on this scale. Hal is the gentleman that um, I get my TSS from, Half Forever. Hal was uh, kind of the pioneer in this TSS stuff, or at least making it available for folks to buy. He sold Loose Shot for a long time, and that's who I still get my shot from. Uh, he's got a website that you can buy the uh, shot from now it's a really seamless process it's uh god memory serves me correct i think it is tungsten it's super the number 18 tungstenshot.com i'm fairly certain um i'll try to include that across the screen here uh, but it's super 18 tungsten shot and it's a real seamless process clicking on there and getting your shot sent to you i got a box of it right there because i ordered a little extra Whenever I get around to it, I'll just get him to send me five pounds. But anyways, I'll get this scale out. 
Let's see, get that. Let's see, here's the buffer that I use. Here is the felt wads, and I've got some more of those right over there I'm gonna have to get because this empties, this bag's about empty here. You'll notice two things, or you'll mention, hear me mention two places uh, pretty often. It's where I get all the components from, is precision reloading and ballistic products. Those are the two places that I get the components for my recipe from. Um, the issue with components is they go in and out of stock, and a lot of times they can be out of stock for some times, and they're not that expensive, the components itself. The expensive part is the actual shot. So um, when you find the components in stock, my tip would be to buy it up, buy up enough of it to comfortably know that you can load you some shells for some time and don't have to worry about it. But anyways, uh, going forward, here's some cork wad. That's part of the recipe. Here's some shot. One thing I do is I keep a small Tupperware like this um, because Hal will send the stuff over in big things like this. Um, I don't want five, 10, whatever pound of shot just sitting on the table because inevitably you'll end up bumping it or something. So I just put enough shot to use. So if I do have a spill, um, I'm not chasing so many of these things around on the hardwood floors. Um, so that's what that is. Let's see, here's some of the Mylar that you would need. Um, I'll get, this one should be enough. Um, some clear fingernail polish. We'll show you what that's for here in a little bit. Got some odd and end tools here that I've found helpful. The funnel, you just about can't do anything without that funnel. Here's just a normal old ratchet. You'll see what I use that for. Just some things that I've kind of picked up on, you know, doing this stuff that works. Half inch bolt, it works. I'll show you on what here shortly. Um, I think that's it. Here's a marker I can mark on the shells. Where's my overshot? Here, Dale. My overshot cards. So. I think that's all we need. The rest of this stuff is extra. Yep, oh, I need that too. This is the little spoon that you're gonna use to kind of scoop everything out. Um, I ordered a, like a whole ring of these spoons off Amazon. If I find them, I'll drop them in the description. This one says TAD on it. I don't know if that is like a technical term, um, but it says TAD, T-A-D, so that's the size of spoon I found works best. And there's my razor knife. So let me get this out of the way now. All right, so let's move on. Uh, first things first, like I mentioned, I've got to trim the excess of each of these holes. I'll take just a regular old razor knife um, and I cut the top off. Kind of get it smoothed up there, like so. Take it out, I'll have a look at it. If there's any uh, super rough little humps or anything that I left, I'll just kind of Look at it and smooth it out so that it will get a good, nice, smooth roll crimp, which is what we'll be putting in these things here shortly. Let's see here. That one's nice. Drop the next one in. And this is something you can do when you're sitting around watching TV with your old lady after you eat you a bowl of chili or something. You can just sit down there in your recliner while she's sewing a sweater or something. You can sit there and trim your holes. You can do a lot of this stuff while you're sitting in your recliner, like enjoying a episode of Sex in the City or something. Let's see here. That one looks pretty good. And repeat. All right, all five shell holes are now at the appropriate length. Kind of tidy up around here. Get this bad boy down here. All right, next thing, you'll also notice, that's probably worth mentioning, is this shell block um, that these things sit up right in. Um, it's pretty obvious why you use these. These things, if you were just loading these shells and leaving them, man, that's, that's, that's an accident waiting to happen. So these shell blocks kind of keep you from causing a, causing a mess. Got a little high spot on this one. I need to figure that one out there. There you go, you smooth out our old boy, can't ever tell. You might be the one, and get you right. But anyways, um, Chubbs turned me on these shell blocks. Actually, Chubbs was the first person I ever rolled any of this stuff with. He uh, had been rolling it for a year or so when I jumped into it, and uh, we rolled about 50 of them in a day. You want to know how long it roll, takes to roll 50 shells? Well, go roll them up, and then imagine doing that sitting beside Chubbs. It was a long day. So anyway, 
There's your little shell, shell uh, block there. I got this one from Ballistic Products. Next thing we're gonna do is you're gonna use this little scale that I just mentioned. Turn it on. It's very important to familiarize with this yourself with this scale because you need to calibrate the scale when you turn it on for the first time to make sure that if it says 50 grains or 14 grains, whatever, that it's actually 15 grains or 14 grains or whatever. They give you a little weight with the thing. Pass, we're good to go. And like I said, it's very important to familiarize yourself with this scale because you do need to, it goes from grams to grains to ounces. I think that's what it is, grain, ounces, grains. Yep, and then count, I think is what that stands for. I don't know, I don't use that setting. But anyways, you gotta make sure you got it on the right setting because there's a difference in grams and grains. And so anyway, um, we're gonna start out by putting some little gun powders, what mine, my recipe calls for. Put your little tray on there and tear the tray so that everything's out at zeroed out so that you know exactly how much you're putting in there. And let me look up my powder real quick. We got our powder. Let me take this off. The powder you can get from a little bit everywhere. I can't remember where I got this from. It'd be great if you can find it on the shelf. If not, you gotta pay that hazmat fee to get it delivered to you because they gotta deliver it on like an 18 wheeler truck. So that costs you more than the powder itself will. So it's really good if you can find this stuff at Cabela's or one of these sporting goods store. Um, but anyways, I'm gonna put the required amount in this here deal. It's pretty important, fellas. Take your time on this. Let's get it right. Perfect. Take my funnel. Shell number one now has its powder. Repeat the process. Make sure it's zero. Required amount. Like I said, I'm not gonna give you specifics on my recipe because there's a wealth of knowledge out there. There's a lot of forums like Gobbler Nation where these guys have just, with ex extensive research, and how the gentleman I mentioned earlier that you can buy your shot for will also share recipes with you if you buy your shot from him. So you can uh, get in touch with him and he can talk to you about recipes and get you kind of set up on the components you're going to need, give you a list of components and, and kind of get you all squared away. So there is... Shell number two, ready to rock and roll. Make sure she's zero. And I'm going to repeat this process a few more times here. All right, that's number five. We got that done. All right. I like to tap these little puppies down in there just a little bit, make sure everything's nice and level. Like so. Next thing we're gonna do is add the wads. So the wads come next. You got the hole, you got the powder, then you got the wads. So my recipe that I use calls for VP92 wads, or on this bag here from Ballistic Products, it says PT2092. Either way, not important. This is my recipe. That may not be the recipe you're using. This is all just in that components list. You'll get with whatever shell you decide it's going to be best for your setup next you simply put the wads down in the hole like so making sure you put the, obviously the hollow cut part facing up because that's what's going to hold everything else your shot and everything else and you'll put the kind of the flat little indented side down slide it in the shell hole like so in each one of them. This is where I found that my handle of my ratchet is pretty convenient. I'll just take it, slide it in there. Just tap it down, make sure those wads are kind of firmly seated. I don't want to do nothing too crazy. You do have a loaded primer and some gunpowder there, so don't go to beating it with a hammer or nothing. But I do just like having it nice and firm. 
Make sure you put your lid back on your powder too. We obviously don't want that getting moist. I should have done that back when. So anyways, now we've got all the, um, the wads placed, kind of seeded, I guess you could say. We are going to add our cork. This is what my recipe called for. Actually, I've already pulled it out over here, haven't I? So we've got five pieces of cork. I'm gonna drop them down in the wad. You just wanna make sure that obviously you've got the wad opening and you're just gonna place that cork in there so that it fits flat on the bottom. Here again, that's where I found the end of my ratchet kinda of is that perfect diameter. Kinda of get it, seat it down in there. You can use about anything. Like sometimes if it gets a little crooked, I'll take like the end of this little Sharpie here and I'll reach in there. That way I can kind of push one corner to get it to where it's nice and flat. And then I'll use my... There we go. Next is the Mylar. This is, I won't call it a tricky part, but it is a... Um, Takes a little paying attention to detail as far as this mylar. Mylar is just these thin, clear pieces of plasticky filling stuff. I don't know any type of technical terms. But essentially on my recipe here, you have to, the mylar you'll notice um, what I have is a little bit longer than it is wide. You've got to fold it lengthwise. So the length is this way and you're folding it, rolling it on itself like so, and you put it inside the wad and slide it down to it, kind of butts up to that cork wad you have down in there. All right, the reason you do that is because basically your shot's gonna sit inside that mylar and the mylar kind of rolls down the barrel with it, I think, and kind of protects things. But this mylar in itself is not long enough or wide enough to reach around the whole entire interior of the wad. That's why you gotta use two pieces. Um, so essentially you do the same thing in this one, but the mylar is actually a little long for the wad as well. You want the mylar to finish flush with the wad. So essentially you stick that first piece down in there. I'll take a pin and kind of make sure I've got that mylar kind of pressed against the sides, make sure it's seated. Then you'll take that pen and you'll reach in there and you wanna mark the edge of that mylar right at the top of the wad. Do it on both sides. This is just kind of what I do. So anyways, now that piece of mylar is marked. I'll pull it out. Then you have a little marked piece of mylar on both sides there so that you know what to do. I used to take scissors and I would cut each piece of mylar but those, so that I'd have it at the proper length, just like so. But this is that nifty little thing that my brother kind of brought into the picture that is a lifesaver. I won't say it's a lot. It, it saves some time. It's pretty convenient. I guess it's for like trimming paper or something. I'm not really sure what it's for exactly, but he's a school teacher and he kind of stumbles up on these cool little gadgets in his school teaching world. But basically now, after I've done this a time or two, I know I have it marked on this thing how long this mylar needs to be cut so I can slide it in here, go to that mark that I have on the thing here, and you just press this little button down to slide it over. You kind of hold your mylar in place with this little ruler that's on a pivoter. I don't know what this thing is even called, but I'll include it in the description if I can even find it on Amazon. But you just take this little thing, you push it down, it's like a little razor blade and it cuts the mylar nice and straight. Now, why is this cool? Because now, I always like to double check this, but now I can take my mylar and cut it at like three or so pieces at a time. That fits nice and flush. And all of it's gonna be the same because all the shells are obviously have the same components in there. So I'll take See, here's two of them. I'll get them nice and flush. I'll slide them in there. I have it marked. So I know exactly where I'm at here. And I will slide the little cutter over it. And there's some more pieces and I don't have to manually reach in there and mark every single one. 
you can tell how much time that would actually save. So kudos to Drew for stumbling onto that. Nice and flush. But anyways, as I was mentioning earlier, um, the Mylar, one piece of Mylar by itself will not cover the full interior of the hole. So that's why you got to put one, say like this inside the hole, then you put the second one like this. So you are encompassing the hole diameter, interior diameter. So you've got one, you'll have a little gap there where it doesn't cover it all. Take the other one and slide it down in there and place it so that you have the full interior diameter of the shell covered. Let's repeat this process. Let's get us some more Mylar out here. I found that if you try to do more than three pieces at a time on this little majig, that it uh, will kind of make your Mylar bend and won't cut it straight. So I like to do three pieces at a time. I'll stack it up nice and straight. So I've got it and I'm holding it down. Got them cut. There's three more. Let me see how many we got here. You just gotta kind of roll them on themselves. Like you're rolling old Lucky Strike or something. Slide that in there. Roll this one. Slide it in there. There we go. Got the Mylar completely on each one of those holes now. We're all finished up with that. Let me move my trimmings to my trash pile over here in the corner. And we'll move on down the line. Let me put my Mylar up here. All right, so the next thing, we gotta put some felt wads in there. A fresh bag of them. Here again, some recipes don't call for felt wads but mine does actually calls for two of them. So these little felt wads, you put them in there just like your cork you did earlier. I just take one, I kind of slide it down in there, push it with my finger. Now you need to take your pen, kind of make sure it's seated flat. Make the next one, slide it in there. Make sure it's seated flat there. This is where I'll take the end of my ratchet again. I'll kind of be in careful that you don't catch the edge of that mylar and wrinkle it when you do this, but slide the ratchet and I'll just kind of firm everything up down there. Here again, we're going to repeat that process four more times. There we go. And essentially what you've got now is the wad, you've got the cork in the bottom, you've got the mylar around the edges of the wad, outside edges of the wad, then you've got these felt spacers on the inside of the mylar. It kind of takes that mylar and presses it against the side so that it's not got a tendency to kind of fold in or, or get out of place. Those felt wads are gonna go in there and kind of push it to the side and keep it there. So let's do this. Another thing worth mentioning is sometimes if you tapping that stuff down in there with something like I have, which is just the diameter of the interior of that wad, you will uh, inevitably, inevitably catch the edge of the mylar and uh, may pull one of the mylar kind of out. And when that happens, um, you'll have to reach down in there. It's always nice to have a pair of tweezers. Um, and you can reach down there and pull that felt out and then seat your mylar and then repeat the process. So after we've got our felt wads in place, the next thing is the fun part and that is adding the shot. Um, today we're gonna be loading some number nines. That's what my recipe calls for. That's what I like to shoot where I can. Um, you gotta make sure you take your scale, you turn it on and you change it from grains to ounces. Um, an ounce and five eighths of number nines is what we'll be putting in there. Can't remember if I just said that. If I did, you just heard it twice. Um, going to put my tray on there and I'm going to tear it so that we start at zero. I'm going to get my little Tupperware full of shot here and we're going to add an ounce and five eighths of shot. The scale is going to be in decimals. It's going to be, um, so you'll need to figure out what one and five eighths is going to look like on here. Essentially for you boys from Auburn, I'm just kidding. I like picking on people from Auburn because I got a bunch of buddies over there. But anyways, Five divided by eight is 0.625, so it should read 1.625 is an ounce and five eighths a shot. Let's see if we can figure that out here. Mm. 
Bingo. I'm gonna take my funnel, make sure you get it on the inside of the mylar, and add the beautiful shiny TSS. Drop it in your next shell hole. Grab you some more number nines. Woo, grab too many. Perfect. Shell number two. Shell number three. Shell number five. All right. The first thing you want to do when you're done with that is put the top back on those TSS because trying to hunt them down is rough. So anyways, now we have the shot in there, my recipe. Next calls for buffer. There are a lot of um, recipes out there that do not call for buffer, but this particular recipe does. And that is some fun stuff to deal with. I'll show you here in a second. We gotta switch it back to grains. We gotta tear the little tray. This is buffer. This is the dangdest stuff if you've never dealt with it. This is some kind of super round stuff. It's like special round or something. Because whenever you, you, it's unreal how round or slippery or whatever you wanna call this stuff. It is uh, crazy to deal with. And if you put it in this tray, you'll know what I'm talking about as soon as you do. And um, the thing about it is super light, super light. Um, so if something happens and you ever mess up or whatever, because it'll happen, um, I have had to dump a shell out. You don't want to obviously cache the TSS. It's, ex you know, it's expensive. But I've actually had to take, once you'll see, I take my buffer, anyway, um, I've had to dump, take a shell, dump it out into like anything, like this cap right here even, and you'll take some compressed air and just hit that thing just the smallest little bit. This buffer will be sent into orbit, and goodness knows where it goes, but that shot will be left there just as shiny and perfect and clean as you could ever imagine. That, that buffer's some crazy stuff. So anyways, I like to make sure all my little pellets are inside the mylar there. And what I have found, and this is just through experience, I have found back in the day, I would pour this buffer right on top of that shot, and I used to have a piece of cardboard, and I would just shake it. And I would shake it, shake it, shake it, until I, um, everything was about 50-50. If you looked into the top of the hole, you would see about 50% buffer, 50% shot, kind of a perfect little mixture. And that's where I would stop. But I have noticed, just through tinkering, that if you, be a little bit more diligent to get that buffer kind of evenly distributed through the whole shot column there that it um, puts a better, prettier, more evenly distributed pattern. To do this, one of my buddies suggested this bad boy, which is like a dental dam um, dentistry thing, vibration thing. You push, you well, when you have it, no, oh, I gotta turn it on. Turn it on and it just buzzes, a little vibrating little thing. So. Essentially what you do is, or what I do is, I'll take my funnel, I'll add about half of my buffer to the top. I'll take my hole, kind of pop it down flat, and I'll, you just ease it on there. You can watch that stuff just kind of bounce and then it'll just flat out and disappear and the shot will just kind of emerge from it. So I will do that until I have the majority of it down. And then it'll just be back to just shot again. I know the majority of that buffer's already sunk down in amongst the pellets there. And I will come back, add the rest of my buffer straight to the top. And I will do the same thing until I get that 50-50 mixture like I just mentioned. Got about a 50-50 mixture there. So that one's ready to rock and roll. Repeat the process. That's teared to zero. Let's add the buffer. Get about half of it in there, about like so. And I have used um, the electric trimmers on the side of the hole before to vibrate the, the buffer down in there. And like I said, for the longest time, I just took it and shook it back and forth. Um, it works. I have just found that there's some small advantages to doing it this way. So that's kind of the way I've transitioned into doing it. 
Um, I think this little contraption over here, this dental vibration thing is about 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. Um, just makes life a little easier. Beautiful. Repeat the process, and I bet y'all can't guess how many times we're gonna do this. You're right, we're gonna do it three more times since we've got three more shells there. Ooh, hit that one with my nail on the head. This is a cool little part of the process though because at this part of the process is where Sleazy put some of his uh, late father's ashes in with his shot. So kind of a way that he still gets to hunt with his dad. But he substituted some of this buffer for a few of the ashes his dad left behind. Pretty cool deal there. There's the last one. So we've got all the buffer added to all five shell holes. Now what's left is adding the overshot cards. Um, this is kind of the final touches. The overshot cards are kind of what goes on top and sandwiches everything down. Let's get five of those out. And essentially with the overshot cards, I just hold the hole and you'll notice that one side of the overshot card's a little waxy and it's kind of a uh, domed on one side. The other side's kind of flat and a little bit more uh, I think it's got, yeah, it's got a little bit more of a matte finish. Um, but essentially you're gonna just take this and slide it right down on top of what you got going on there. So when you have all the overshot cards in place, this is when I use this half inch bolt that I pulled out of the box earlier. Found the bolt head fits perfectly down in a 20 gauge hole, just like so. And what I like to do is just take them out, press them down to get it nice and tight. Um, then I'll kind of glance because um, sometimes these overshot cards will get kind of cattywampus in your, in your hole, and I just like to make sure they're kind of somewhat even all the way around. Um, and when I get those in place, there we go. I'll do the same thing with each one. I'll kind of set it on the table and push that bolt a little bit. I'm sure there's probably a more technical way of doing this, but this is the way I do it. It's worked for me. Everything looks pretty even there. Let's press these. You're just taking these components essentially and making sure they're seated down on each other nice and tight. Um, you don't want to do anything extreme because like hitting them with a hammer here again, you've got live shot in there. You've got a live primer. You don't want to do anything too crazy. Not to mention the more you start squeezing this stuff together and whatever you're affecting the pressures. Hal has shot these loads and knows the pressures that they're producing out your barrel or whatnot. And so there's stuff you gotta do there to be safe. And so you don't wanna do anything crazy that would change that pressure too much to make it a dangerous deal. A little bit of that buffer is gonna come out around those overshot cards. So I just give it a little fresh air there. Nothing extreme, just to kind of get that buffer out of the way. And next, we're going to tidy up around here just a little bit. I'm going to shift this camera because we're going to get on the drill press and we're going to do the roll crimps right on top of these bad boys and see if we can't get it all fixed up nice for them. Okay, so now that we've got the camera all switched around here so you guys can see the actual rolling process, what I need to get next, I've got it here. Got to get myself a Q-tip and just a drop of WD-40 or rim oil or some type of lubricant. We've got our shells ready here. We've got our um, overshot cards are about even all the way around. If you look, you can kind of tell from the side there that they're kind of situated in there even. But what we've got here is just a drill press. It's just a cheap drill press. This one says Central Machinery 12 Speed Bench Drill Press. I think I got this at Harbor Freight. Um, the trick with the drill presses and doing a roll crimp is um, you got to get one that the RPMs are low. This one goes down to 300 RPMs, and that's what works best. If you get it to where it's rotating too fast, it kind of melts, which is what you're doing is you're just melting the outside edge of this hole, and it kind of folds in on itself, and your uh, kind of holds everything in place until you shoot it. So if it spins too rapidly, it'll melt it too fast, and it'll cause the shell to be all wompy. You won't get a good um, roll crimp. I've got the 20 gauge vise. Uh, I got this from Precision Reloading here. Um, essentially, you've got to kind of put it in place, measure things up with your um, roll crimping tool here. This roll crimp is also from Precision, if I 
remember correctly, I'll include this stuff, or actually you can go to Precision Reloadings or Ballistic Products and, and find this stuff, but Precision Reloading made this uh, roll crimper here, if I'm not mistaken. This uh, hole here is ready to rock and roll. We're gonna slide it in the vise, tighten things down. I've already got this stuff measured up. I just kind of leave this stuff here, um, but you can basically situate this vise Get it to where everything lines up just right so that the roll goes right down over the top of the hole. I've got some big C clamps here as you can see on the edge of the, uh, the little platform of the drill press so that it's held into place and doesn't shake or move. And essentially you take you a Q-tip with just a drop of some type of lubricant like WD-40. Nothing crazy, you don't want it dripping, but you just want to reduce the friction a little bit around the outside edge of that hole. So I'll go around the top, outside edge there. With a little bit of that, cut her on. You want to bring it over, you want to pause for just a second right at the top of the hole so that it can start heating that plastic up and then you just want to ease on down with your handle over here until you feel it kind of bottom out. Then just bump it a time or two and we should be rocking and rolling here. And she is a beautiful shell right there. Could be the winner. I'm gonna repeat this process. Gonna drop that hole in this little vise, tighten her down so she don't move. Take, this is the wet side here, take that, and roll it around the inside there to reduce a little friction. We'll turn her back on and knock this one out. Like I said, you pause right at the beginning, not long, just a second or so. Then you'll slowly just kinda let the pressure just a bump at a time or two. You don't want to put too much down with pressure when you're rolling that because it will cause your hole to kind of bulge out on the sides, cause some issues with cycling or whatnot. So you seriously are just taking this handle and just easing it down on there. Just, you know, just barely a little bit of resistance, but you'll feel when it bottoms out when you hit, you know, everything starts stacking up nice and tight and you can just bump it a time or two and roll it out and you'll be making some beauties. Here's the last one. One thing also that might be worth mentioning is I have found None of these shells did it, but I have found that the um, overshot card, sometimes I guess there's a little bit of suction when that um, crimping tool kind of fits down over the top, and I've noticed that I've seen that overshot card kind of lift up, but I've never had a problem with just carrying on through the process, and it's the, the uh, top of that hole rolls in, and it pushes it right back into place, so I've never had an issue with it making ugly crimps or anything that wasn't gonna work but so there's those five that we've been working on next thing you want to do is um, grab you some nail polish this is uh, just some clear I guess you could use whatever color you wanted to but uh, what you're doing here is you're just trying to kind of waterproof this uh, overshot card a little bit in case you encounter a little moisture while you're out hunting but you're not wanting to just dip it or soak it really heavy I just Apply a little to the top there, nothing too crazy. But I do like to uh, start and kind of get right around the outside, the outer edge. So I kind of tilt the hole on its side like so. I'll put the brush in there and kind of just roll it in my hands and let that polish kind of seep into that seam that's created around the outside. And then I'll just paint over the center and we're good to go. Alrighty, there's all five of them. Got polish on them now. And the last thing I typically do, I mentioned this earlier, is I'll take my Sharpie and I always put the date that I rolled these shells. Like I said, if something happens and I'm shooting them at a piece of paper or I miss a turkey and I decide to pattern my gun, make sure nothing's changed and I shoot and I get some wonky patterns or something and get some holes or whatever, I'll look at the date that hole was uh, or that shell was rolled and I may compare one with the same date just to make sure when I was loading that day I didn't you know wouldn't paying attention put too much buffer got my buffer numbers mixed with my powder numbers or something just making sure that um, 
something crazy didn't happen and I just always it's kind of a, like a little checks and balances type situation I always put the date that I rolled the shale um, on the hull and today is February 15th so and that's it we have now successfully sat down rolled us five killers for the 2021 spring season so um, hope you guys found this helpful I hope somebody out there possibly was looking at rolling their own shells or wanting to see how um, we rolled our shells or I don't know just wanted something to watch um, hopefully you guys found this informative if you did um, stay tuned because there'll be more stuff coming and uh, give the video a like subscribe to the channel do all that fun stuff and we will see you guys on the next one